When you were working during that 86 time when the pressure was on uh, both in, in, in the amount of work you had to produce and were promising to produce and you know the amount of tension and everything else. I mean it, it may be nice but it also creates some, some pressure. Um, did you find while you were working on the line did that continue to feed you with information and ideas or was it becoming more of an obstacle to what you wanted to do? No. <laughs> You're gonna have to go through. Okay. That again. Well, you know how you, 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 the character of the rivet head yes. is working on the line. Okay. Uh, I, I would assume that, that the things that you create in your writing, some of them come from ideas that are kicked off of things you see, people you talk to, situations that occur. Observations. And, yeah. Uh, and, and and you're drawing they, from this source. Okay. From the plan. Now, when you were being asked to produce writing, not lay back and write as you feel like, and when you're done kick it over and the people say, oh, that's great, we'll print it, but rather, hey, we want you to do this and we'll pay you some money for it and we want it done by February 10th, you know. You're getting mm -hmm. deadlines and you're getting right. specific this, things. And you're also working, yeah, and you're also working a heavy amount of hours, you know, more than nine to five. I mean, you're working regular demanding hours. Did you find that your work on the line became an obstacle to writing your stories or was it still a source of inspiration to you? Oh, it's still a source of inspiration. Uh, you know, I, I could never turn away from it. Uh, it just got bothersome, you know, that I would actually have to go to work, you know. Yeah. It was sort of a, you know, catch-22 because uh, the same thing that was bringing me the popularity was the same thing that was keeping me back from generating more personal success mm -hmm. because I could write more if I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. But yet, if I wasn't there, I couldn't write, you know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was uh, a voyeur, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, that's actually what it turned out to be, you know. I was making good money, and, uh, and that's really all I wanted to do is be a, like a 30-year voyeur, you know, a mm -hmm. voice from the inside. And then all these things happened and changed everything dramatically. Mm -hmm. uh, I could no longer be... Uh, looked upon as just another anonymous little, you know, weasel, you know, just another shop rat, mm -hmm. you know, because people would look me out, especially at my mm -hmm. factory, and go, oh, you're the riveted, aren't you? I enjoyed your last article. Uh, do you think you could mention the trim line? <laughs> you know, we're having problems up there, and, you know, I'd say, hey, I don't care, you know, I'm just, you know, the other night the steering gear man wet his pants and he had to go home. I'm writing about that. Mm -hmm. So... I don't know. What was the question? No, I, think, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, how did uh, uh, management feel about this stuff? Did you ever get any kind of feedback from them? Uh, I had two members of management ask me for autographs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I had uh, my foreman uh, deliver me fan mail once. But uh, otherwise, outside of peeking around corners and boxcars, they... Uh, Never really had a lot to say to me personally, one on one. Uh, I did have a foreman confront me one time in the office. We had a big blow up about something I'd written for the Detroit Free Press, where I had stated that I was in a bar across the street while the line was moving, and you know he was just, uh, you know, all over me up and down. Mm -hmm. I said, "Listen, this is newspaper, mm -hmm. and this is ink, and this is stuff I done outside of the shop." Mm -hmm. I said. Don't ever bring my personal life into this again, mm -hmm. you know. And we had a big row with uh, the uh, committee man and stuff, mm -hmm. and so he he backed off. But really, management as a whole, you know, they declined to let NBC into the factory once they knew why they wanted mm -hmm. to come in, along with several other new uh, news uh, people, mm -hmm. uh, film people, and. Uh, but they kept their distance, mm -hmm. you know. There's nothing they could do, you know. Was the problem, like with your foreman, when you're talking about the, having the fight, was he confusing, I mean, reality with fiction, that he didn't understand that this was a character, and the Riverhead was not Ben Hamper, that you were you, the person that was there, and this, these stories you told weren't necessarily, I mean, maybe this was true, but they weren't necessarily true. I mean, this was, or at least they weren't necessarily you. You have to understand this individual was Mussolini. Okay. And uh, he just could not take the fact that one of his uh, serfs uh -huh. was uh, uh, gaining any amount of popularity, especially when it would be humorous stuff 
uh, talking about <clears throat> miscreant adventures uh, of the rivet head, yeah. but I, you know, AKA Ben Hamper. Mm -hmm. And so he couldn't take that, you know, he couldn't understand that. I had had previous foremans had really been big fans of mine. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's good, Ben, you know, it's mm -hmm. good. But this guy was just one guy who was like a troubleshooter, you know, you know, the, um, you know, the guy from out west who was going to come down and clean up mm -hmm. the town, you yeah. know, and he was going to take the rivet head with him, but uh, it wasn't possible. So the rivet head's still here and he's not. The rivet head's, well, the rivet head isn't really still here. Yeah. The book will be out, oh. yeah. <laughs> but the rivet head isn't on the line currently, no. Yeah.